brother took his life. Oh. So we want to pray for him and his family and just things like that are just so hard to process and understand. But we know that God, God is, is with us and that he helps us through difficult times like this and we want to pray a special prayer for Mario and his family. Would you bow your heads with me please? Father, there's so many things in life that just hit us like a ton of bricks and we don't know what to do, we don't know why, we don't, we don't understand it, and Father, we just, we just look to you, we look to you for understanding and, and for peace, Father, we know that uh, Mario's family is just grieving over this, and, and Father, we feel for him, and with him and pray that you will uphold him, help him to keep looking to you for that strength and Father for his brother we just pray that, that you will grant him mercy and that he can be at peace and, and be with you Father. We just, Father there's so many things that we go through in life that are just, just really hard for us to deal with and it's helpful to come together and share those with each other and to bear one another's burdens and it's also helpful for us Father to just consider Christ and as we have just done in the Lord's Supper and remember the burden that he bore for us and just the difficult times in his life that he he had to go through and how he, he stayed faithful to you Father and we just pray that for Mario and his family that, that they will find peace and, and be able to go on knowing that you are with them and will help them through it. Father, just pray your blessings upon this body of people that love you and have come here to praise you this morning and worship you and just ask that you would bless each one of our lives and, and help us to continue to draw closer to you every day. We, we know, Father, that one day we'll be in heaven with you and, and no longer have to deal with the struggles of this life and we look forward to that day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, we are wrapping up this series of lessons this morning on investing in eternity. And this was all born out of this scripture from Matthew 16, 26, where Jesus said, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? And, you know, it really makes you think about all the things that we invest in in life. I mean, we're all putting our time and our energy and our money towards things in this life. Education, uh, <clears throat> retirement, uh, entertainment, recreation. I, I mean, everything that we do in life is an investment of our time, our energy, and our money. And so what Jesus is saying here is that there is nothing more important to invest in than eternity. That, that there's nothing in this life worth more or more important than your spiritual soul. And so we've, we've talked about uh, a lot of different areas that we need to be investing in eternity. And I want to just quickly remind you of some of the lessons that we have looked at. We, we started with the passage of Scripture that, that was just quoted this morning at the Lord's table by Converto. Uh, that Jesus said, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven where that can't happen. And he said, Wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we talked about how important that we store up eternal treasures in heaven and not be so concerned about treasures on earth. Then we talked about the kingdom of heaven. We looked at two parables that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 13. The parable 
of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl of good price. And in both those stories, when they found this very valuable thing, whether it was the hidden treasure or the pearl of great price, they, they went and sold all that they had to go back and purchase it. And Jesus was making the point that the kingdom of heaven has that kind of value. That it's worth selling everything that you have, giving up everything that you have to attain it. Then we talked about spiritual growth. And we talked about how important it was to grow spiritually in order to keep focused on the kingdom of heaven and storing up treasures in heaven. That, that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him. And so we talked about how important it is to study the Bible, to learn the Bible, to learn God's will, and how important it is to, to be a part of the church and, and be invested in the church, and how important it is to practice those spiritual disciplines of prayer and partaking of the Lord's Supper and things of that nature. We talked about how important it is to add to our faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and so on. And so it's so important that we invest in our spiritual growth. We next talked about the transformation. We looked at Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where Paul said, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Yeah. And we talk about how important it is not to let the world mold us, not to let culture, not to let political correctness, not to let anything in this world mold us by its pattern, but rather let God mold us. Let the Word of God mold us. Fill our minds with God's Word. Be renewed. Think differently. Have a different perspective of life. And then we talked about godliness. And how in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, you know, physical exercise is of some value. But godliness has value for all things. Both for this life and the life to come. Right. And how important it is that we not just go to the gym, you know, and, and work out and keep fit, but that we, we, we practice spiritual disciplines and we work at becoming godly, becoming more and more like Jesus. And then last week, we talked about investing in doing good. And how in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, Paul wrote to... Timothy, and he said, this is what I want you to teach the church. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. By the way, this past week, my stock lost over $30,000 in value. That's how uncertain wealth is. But my heart's still beating. So I will praise God. Beating a little faster. But I will praise God. But you can't hope in this, this world. You can't put your hope in the things of this world because they can vanish in a moment. Put your hope in God. Keep Him at the forefront of your life and, and in your mind. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And, and he, said, he goes on to say, and so command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be yes. generous and willing to share. And we focus on how important it is to God that we be good people. You know, it's interesting in, in the spiritual growth sermon, the very first thing that he said to make every effort to add to your faith was goodness. Goodness, because he wants us to be good people who do good deeds. And not just once in a while, but let that be who we are, what defines us. You know, Jesus, 
when, when Peter was trying to explain who Jesus was, he says, you remember that guy in, from Nazareth who always went around doing good? Man, what a legacy Jesus had. I want one like his. And this morning we're going to end with this idea of knowing your enemy. You know, when I think about this, I think that there is nothing, nothing more threatening to our spiritual lives than being ignorant of Satan. Right? You can, you can practice all this other stuff. You can, you can try to store up heavenly treasure and, and seek the kingdom first and find value in it and do all these things. But if you're ignorant of Satan, I guarantee it's going to be a, a rough go. It's going to be a really, really rough go. And so... In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul wrote to these Christians in Ephesus, and he said this. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our battle is not against people. It's against Spiritual forces. And Peter wrote and said this. He said, so be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Be alert. Take this seriously is what he's saying. Because your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion. And I've shared this with you a million times. So I'm going to share it again. If you've ever watched a documentary about lions, you know how they hunt. They hunt in a pack and they hunt from a distance and they hunt in stealth. They get in the high grasses and they follow the flock and they, they study the flock and they look for the weakest link. They look for the old. They look for the lame. And they target them. And then when they're ready to attack, they go after them and they separate them from the flock. The rest of the flock runs off, but the weak one can't keep up. And so they separate them away from the flock and then it's, it's over. And what he's saying is Satan is like that. He's stealth. He's stealth. And, and he's stalking us. And he's looking for that, that perfect opportunity to attack us unknowingly. And if we're not ready for it, we're not going to make it. And so this is really serious, that we need to invest in understanding who Satan is and how he works and being able to identify when he's, he's working on us. Look, the devil's real. He's not a myth. <coughs> he's not some fictitious character dressed up in a red suit with a pitchfork as the cartoons betray him. He's not just a metaphor or a symbol of evil. I was stunned this week. I read this. I like statistics. So whenever I'm studying for a lesson or something, I'll, I'll Google you know, statistics on what people believe about Satan. And Barna Group is a research group that surveys Christians. They go around, they survey a, a large group of Christians and they, they sample with different questions and they find out what they believe about certain things. I was stunned by this. 40% of Americans who claim to be Christians do not even believe in Satan. I'm not talking about 
non-Christians, these are Americans who claim to be Christian. They don't believe that Satan's real. They think that he's just a symbol for evil or, or a metaphor, that, that he's not a real being. Another 19% kind of agree with that. So we're up to almost 60% of all American Christians don't even have respect for Satan. It's not real in their minds. Is that stunning? But it's not just that. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit either. That's scary to me. That's scary to me. And man, Satan must be loving it. <laughs> Satan is a real spiritual being that we ignore to our own detriment. Jesus knew he was real. I mean, the very first story after his baptism is about him being tempted by Satan. And I don't picture this like Jesus talking to himself here. It's not like, oh, if you really think you're the son of God, you, you can turn that rock into bread. No, you know what the scripture says. I, I don't view it that way. I view that a real spiritual being was having a conversation with Jesus. It was the devil. And he was tempting Jesus. And when you, when you read through the Gospels and, and, and see what Jesus had to say about Satan, he, he called him the evil one. He called him the enemy. He called Satan the prince of this world three times. He called him a liar, the father of lies. He called him a murderer from the very beginning. Jesus said that he saw Satan fallen from heaven, that he has a kingdom, that evil men are his sons, that Satan sowed tares among the wheat, or good, I'm sorry, evil among the good. That he snatches the word of God from hearers. That he actually causes illness and bound a woman for 18 years. That he desired to have Peter to sift him. That he has angels and that the eternal fire in hell is prepared for him. Jesus believed in a real devil. A real spiritual being. And Paul talked about it in Ephesians chapter 2 when he, he wrote this. He said, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. In other words, before you became a Christian, you were one of his children. You were one of his disciples. Satan is real and we better get serious about it. Amen. Because he's a formidable enemy. This, this is serious stuff. He has enormous influence in our world. I mean, if, if Jesus said three times that he was the prince of this world, or another translation would have the ruler of this world, Paul called him the God of this age. Revelation says that he has led the whole world astray. He has enormous influence in the world. We see his footprints everywhere. I mean, everywhere you turn, you can see his influence. We're talking about Paul. 
politics this week. Yeah, you can really see him there, can't you? He's the great deceiver. And this is something else, you know. When you think about deception, he is the master deceiver. He deceived Eve in the garden. Sometimes we, I think we think of that as just a, a, a story that, you know, just trying to make some kind of spiritual point. But he deceived Eve into sinning, which brought sin into the world, which caused mankind to be fallen. And then when Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, he mentioned that and he said, you know, I'm worried that you too are going to be deceived, just like Eve. Because you're so ready to just welcome any false teaching that comes your way. You don't have a respect for this. And he said, you know what? There are many false teachers and, and people are believing it. No wonder because Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. I mean, think about this. This is serious. And he's always scheming. Always. He's always looking for some angle to get into your life and bring you down. Just like that lion stalking. You know the story of Job? You remember the first couple chapters where, where God asked Satan, where you been? What did he say? I've been going down the earth to and fro. Been checking things out, seeing where I might have best shot at things. When, when he tempted Jesus, you remember, he, he tried one thing and that didn't work. And he thought, well, maybe if I try this angle, maybe this will work. And that didn't work. And they said, well, maybe I'll try this angle over here. Maybe this one will work. He's a schemer. He's a schemer. And because we can't see him, because we can't scientifically prove that he exists, we tend to just put it out of mind. We don't really even think about what he's doing in our lives. Paul, Paul said to the Corinthians, he says, he says, we're not going to let Satan outwit us because we're not unaware of his schemes. Now, he doesn't just tempt. He doesn't just put us through trials and tribulations. He distracts. He distorts. He uses disassociation, disillusionment, he uses every scheme you can find. You, you ever feel vulnerable by all the scamming that goes on in this life? I mean, I probably get 10 calls a week saying, oh man, your credit card, we need you, we need you to call right away. And, and you know, and, and then you call and they say, well, now what's your credit card number again? And what's the pen on that? And, and what? When does it? Or your social security has been, you know. Yeah. And so when those things happen, we, we back up and we, we think, this is a scam. <laughs> but because you don't see Satan, you just go on with your life. I'm telling you, he's at work. He's at work trying to influence all of us. So James wrote this. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And, and this is a really important point. 
Not only do we need to know who the enemy is and how he works and be able to identify when he's working on us and expose him for who he is and what he's doing, but we need to resist him. I mean, in a, in a strong way. It takes a conscious effort. And it starts with consciously submitting ourselves to God. In other words, saying, you know, God, I want to be filled with you. And I want to live according to your will. I want to be your child. So I'm going to live out my life trying to apply those truths that you have given me. I'm going to obey you. When you look at when Jesus was tempted in Matthew chapter 4, again, you know, Satan said, you can, if you're God's son, you can change his rock into bread. And what did Jesus say? Man cannot live by bread alone, but only by the words that come from God. Yeah. And then he said, you know, well, well, come on up here and look at this. I'll give you all this. And, and he said, no, you don't tempt the Lord your God. But what you see in Jesus is this consciousness of God's rule in his life. Yeah. So that when Satan tries to tempt him, when Satan tries to distort the truth or distract him or whatever. He goes back to God. He goes and he remembers what God's will is. And we have to do the same thing. Amen. Submit ourselves to God. More than just come to church. This is a daily, hourly, minute by minute activity. Submitting ourselves to God. Peter said, be self-controlled and alert. And again, that idea of taking it serious. You know, when I get in my car and I drive over here, you guys know I struggle with this. Right? And I get really teed off with the people in the car that's not driving the way I think they should. But guess what? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And what Satan is doing there is he's trying to use this weakness of mine to get me angry and upset and lash out. Right? So I have to be smart enough to identify this is Satan. This is Satan right here. This isn't that guy. It's not his driving. This is Satan working on me. This is one of his schemes. And he's winning. <laughs> and so you have to be conscious of this stuff. You have to be conscious of God. You have to be conscious of the devil's influence. And so you have to take every thought captive. You know, when you're thinking bad thoughts, those aren't coming from God. Those aren't His thoughts. Those are being influenced by Satan. And so when we, when we know that that's going on, when we know that our thoughts are not God's thoughts, we need to expose Satan and identify that as one of his schemes and say, we're not going there. You're not winning. Paul said, I take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. I resubmit my life to God and resist the devil. And it also takes persistent resistance because he is persistent so it's not going to be over the first time you do it we have to strongly resist him one of the stories in the bible that's always captured my attention is in 
Matthew 16, verse 23. And here Jesus is talking to Peter. Actually, Jesus is being talked to by Peter. Jesus was telling them that he must go up to Jerusalem and that he would be arrested and that he would be put to death, but he would rise again and everything was going to be okay. And Peter, it says, pulled him aside and rebuked him. Peter pulled Jesus aside and rebuked him and said, never let that be, Lord. Remember Peter, he was the one that says, I will fight to my death for you. We're not going to let that happen to you. Do you remember what Jesus' response was? Get behind me, Satan. Now, I'm not advising you to use that line on people that you think are being used by Satan. Okay? I'm not, don't do that. That won't go over well. But what you see in that is that Jesus identified Satan. See, it wasn't Satan doing it himself. He was using Peter to say it. Right? And he was trying to tempt Jesus to back out of it. And Jesus said, I know what you're doing here, Satan. Stop it. Get behind me. We have to be that kind of, we have to be that serious about it. It's, if Timothy was here right now, he'd say, it's not a game, Jim. It's not a game. It is not a game. This is real. You don't know how many times I have sat across from someone weeping telling me what Satan had led them to do. And now looking at it and saying, I can't believe I fell for that. Look, this is not a game. You need to be self-controlled and alert. And we must not give Satan a foothold. Don't let him get a foot in the door. Uh, whenever I read this scripture in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, in 25 he talks about when you are angry, don't let your, the sun go down on your anger and give Satan a foothold. And, and the picture I always get is this salesman at the door, you know, he's coming selling vacuum cleaners and he knocks on the door and, and you look through a crack and you see the vacuum cleaner out there and you're like, oh no, I don't, I don't need it. And so you say, no thank you, I don't need one. And he sticks his foot in the door. And you're like, can't close the door. So then, you, you know, you try to be respectful and you say, okay, what, what is it? I want to show you this vacuum cleaner. It's amazing. It does all this work and everything. It's, just, it's the best vacuum cleaner ever made. Better than Dyson. <clears throat> and he says, I just want to show you one demonstration and then I'll leave. And so you open the door and you let him in. And he pours, you know, ketchup and whatever on the carpet. Gets this thing out and he starts running in and it cleans it all up. And you're looking at it and you're going, wow. You know what? I think I need one of those. And isn't that how Satan does it to us? If he can just get his foot in the door and then he just, he just teases us with all these little niceties, these good things that... And then, boom. Can't even let him get a foot in the door. Don't give him a foothold. So what does that mean? That means don't blow off the little stuff in your life that Satan's attacking. Like getting angry. I mean, how many times do you get angry? 
You never think about Satan being involved in that, do you? Do you, when you start feeling your blood boiling, going, oh, there's Satan again. No. No, you start thinking about what you're going to say. Or, or what you're going to do. You know, I'm going to... I'm going to flip this guy off, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to, you know, and you're not thinking, oh, here we go again, Satan's back at it. So we have to deal with even the little things in our lives. We have to identify this as this is not from God. So if it's not from God, who's it from? Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil. Paul goes on in, in Ephesians to say that we must put on the full armor of God. Yeah. Not parts of it, but all of it. And, and we understand this, you know. We, those of us that play sports anyway, understand that a catcher doesn't get behind the plate in the game without his chest protector and his shin guards and his mask and cup and all those things that are going to protect him, right? You wouldn't let him go out there. I, I remember when I was in Little League, the coach would come up and say, you got your cup on, Jim? It's like, I was a catcher. Yes, sir. I mean, this, this when, we, when we're doing battle with someone who is so deceptive and so good at it and so powerful, we need to be prepared. 100%. Put on the full armor of God. You can go back and read that one for yourself. But. Right. And then finally, Paul wrote this to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, it says this, Since the children have flesh and blood, He too shared in their humanity, so that by His death He might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Listen, we have to trust in Jesus for the victory. And this is probably the most important point I can bring to you. That Jesus has already defeated Satan. Yes. <laughs> he defeated it. On the cross, he, he won. He won. Because on the third day, he rose again. Amen. You see, Satan has power. And the power that he has is death. And so when you sin, what happens? You die. You die spiritually. And so he has us imprisoned and fearful of that judgment day. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He destroyed the power of the devil by overcoming death, by rising from the dead, and promising to us that if we trust him, we too will rise again. That Satan has no power over us. And this is a really important point as well. The only power Satan has is your ignorance. That's it. The only power that Satan has is the power you give to him. He's defeated. Jesus freed us from the power of the devil. The devil has no power over us anymore. And you know, I, I could preach a whole sermon on this, that, that Satan, you know, with his, his deception and his lies and his, his schemes, he gets us to sin. And sin is what causes us to die spiritually. But Jesus has taken our sins away. 
He's freed us from our sins so that the power of the devil isn't power anymore. And he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness. I like this scripture a lot, Colossians 1, 13, where it says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of light. Yeah. And you know, you know how I see that? All my life, before I was a Christian, I lived in darkness. I lived in a big fog. I used to smoke pot every day when I was a teenager. Every day. And my, my head was just in a cloud. It, it, it was amazing when I quit smoking pot. <laughs> the clarity I had. It was like taking Claritin extra strength. You know? <laughs> just cleared my head up and I could think and process things normally. But Satan keeps us in the darkness. He keeps us in where we don't really... We don't really see things clearly. We don't really understand what's going on clearly. And he likes us to be in the dark. Because then he can, he can manipulate us. But Jesus has rescued us from that darkness. <laughs> and put us into the kingdom of light where we can see. And now we can identify Satan. We can expose his works. We can call him out on it. He can't pull the wool over our eyes anymore, right? Isn't that what Jesus said in John 8? When he said, If you hold to my word, then are you truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And, and you know how I apply that to my life? When Satan's trying to convince me to do something that I know is not good for me, I just say, you know what? I'm not falling for it. I know the truth. I know the truth. I'm not going down that road with you. Yeah. And finally, by trusting in Jesus, <coughs> Completely. Trust him in him. We too can over, overcome the devil. And so we must keep trusting in the blood of Jesus. You know, Satan's goal is to weaken you to the point where he can destroy you. And one of his greatest tools is guilt. And this is what Satan's going to try to do to you every day. He's going to try to say to you, you are a failure. You're a failure. You just sinned again. <clears throat> you, you, just, you just did it again. Yeah, every time I get in my car, it's like, Jim, you just did it again. Can't believe you did it again. Haven't you learned yet? And Satan wants us to focus on our failures and our sin and get discouraged and give up. That's what he wants. He wants us to think, look, God, you're not worthy of this stuff. Right? You know how many Christians I've had come to me and say, you know what? I, I thought about not coming to church because I just really don't feel worthy about it. I'm like, Come on, we need to sit down and talk. Let me tell you about Jim. Because Jim certainly isn't worthy enough either. We've got to trust in the blood of Jesus. Either we're saved by God's grace and mercy, or we're not saved at all. Because you're not saved by your works. You're certainly not saved by your merit. By how good you are. There is none righteous on this planet, not even one. So if you're trusting in your, in your ability to earn God's approval, you're not going to make it. 
you got to put your trust in the blood of Jesus. Amen. That He purchased our sin with His blood. Amen. He redeemed us from unrighteousness by His blood. And it's by His blood that we are saved. Amen. And so, keep trusting in the blood. When you fail, and you're going to fail, shake it off, get back up, and try it in. Don't give up. And then keep praying to Him for help. I don't know if you've ever caught this, but in the Lord's Prayer, you guys all know the Lord's Prayer, right? <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from who? From the evil. The evil one. We should be praying that every day. Lord, don't, don't let Satan get me in a place where I can't overcome this. Know this. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Go home and read that one. That there is no temptation greater than what we can withstand because God always provides a way out. Amen. Always. So keep praying for that. You know, Hebrews 4, 16 through 18 says that we are to approach the throne of grace with boldness knowing that Jesus is there to help us in our time of need. That's pretty much all the time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so. And then keep standing. Keep standing firm in the faith to the very end. I like Revelation 2, verse 10, where... Jesus said this to the churches. He said, be faithful. Be faithful. Notice he doesn't say be perfect because that's impossible. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you a crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Amen. Keep trusting in Jesus. Keep trusting in Jesus. You know, this has uh, been a, a, a great study for me, investing in eternity, and I hope it's inspired you a little bit more to, to be thoughtful of our time on earth is short. It's really short. Every day we're moving a little closer to heaven, aren't we? And, and Man, we, we need to be really building up our 401k in heaven. And we've talked about how to do that. By doing good. By, by investing in our spiritual growth. And the kingdom of heaven. And, and allowing God to transform us by the renewing of our minds. And, and change how we view life and, and how we live life. Give yourself to investing in eternity. We're going to sing this song in closing. And it reminds us that this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Let's all stand and sing this together in closing.